As you sit here with this bundle of feelings, there are lots of different feelings you could focus on. There are pains in some parts of your body, pleasant feelings in other parts of your body, and nondescript neutral feelings in still other parts. It's not like you have just one feeling at any one time. That's not the case that there's nothing but pain. As a John Lee once said, if your body were totally in pain, with no pleasure at all, you'd die. So you're alive. There's pleasure someplace. Ferret it out. Look for it. And in the beginning it may not seem all that impressive, but there are pleasant feelings in different parts of the body. The mind does have a tendency to focus on the pain, because that's what its early warning system is all about to figure out where there's pain that you've got to do something about. But you can cut that switch. Focus instead on where the pleasure is. It's like that old book drawing on the right side of the brain, where they teach you not to draw eyes and noses and mouths and other recognizable features of the faces that you're trying to draw. Instead, you focus on drawing the space, say, between the eye and the nose, the space between the nose and the mouth. And you end up with a much better likeness, because you're focusing on things you don't normally focus on. So it's the same with the pleasures and pains in the body. Instead of complaining about where there's stiffness or soreness or sense of blockage in the body, focus on the areas where things are going well. Again, John Lee says it's like going into a house where you know that some of the floorboards are rotten, so you don't step there. You step where the floorboards are sound. When you're eating a mango, you don't eat the rotten spots. You get the spots that are good, and you make the most of them. What this means is you focus on the pleasure in a way that helps to maintain it, allow it to grow. And when it feels good, you can spread it around. As the Buddha says, you want to suffuse the body with a sense of ease, a sense of fullness that you can come to as you focus on the breath. This all comes under the second frame of reference, feelings in and of themselves as your frame of reference. If you read the sutta on the topic, it's possible to see it as telling you simply to st stick with whatever feeling comes up, because it's just a list. These are the different types of feelings you could focus on. There's pleasant feelings, and there are painful feelings, and neutral feelings, and Pleasure of the flesh, pleasure not of the flesh, pain of the flesh, pain not of the flesh, and so on. But if you read the Sutta in context, the Buddha is not telling you just to focus on whatever comes up willy-nilly. For example, with physical feelings, those f pleasures of the flesh, he says, are not the sort of things that you, you want to encourage. If you're practicing, if you're trying to find a good basis for a solid happiness inside, you want to develop the pleasures not of the flesh, i.e., the pleasure that comes from concentration. Because when you look at the sutta in context, there's a passage where the Buddha says, How do you develop the four frames of reverence? You develop them by developing the Eightfold Path. And that includes everything from right view on down to right effort and right concentration. And the sutta itself talks about ardency as one of the qualities that you bring to this practice. Now, ardency means right effort, generating the desire to do what's skillful and to abandon what's unskillful. So there are some ways of focusing on pleasure that are unskillful, and there are some ways of focusing on pleasure that are skillful.
happens, you want to learn how to gain some control over your feelings. Now this may sound strange. How can you control your feelings? Sometimes we have the sense that our feelings are who we really are and that they're a given. But that's not how the Buddha explains it. He says, in every feeling there's an element of fabrication, i.e. an element of intention. This applies to physical feelings as well as to mental feelings. And so what you want to do is learn to see where that element of intention is, and learn how to do that part skillfully. As he says, we, for the sake of having a feeling, we fabricate these feelings. You wouldn't think that we would want to fabricate pain, but we're not skillful in our fabrication. So that's what we come up with. We want feelings of pleasure, but then we end up, oftentimes, creating pain. Now there are certain givens. You've got disease in your body, you've got aches and pains in your body, which come from old karma. You can't do much about that. But as John Lee said, it's not that your body is totally pained. And you do have the choice. Where do you want to focus your attention? What do you want to maximize? Do you want to maximize the pain or maximize the pleasure? What we're doing as we're sitting here meditating is learning how to develop the skills for maximizing skillful kinds of pleasure, skillful ways of approaching the pleasure. There are even skillful forms of distress. The Buddha talks about householder distress and renunciate distress. Householder distress is when you're not getting the physical feelings you want. You don't see the sights you'd like to see or hear the sounds you'd like to hear, smell the smells, taste the tastes, get the physical contacts you'd like to feel, and you get upset. And for most of us, the way of dealing with that is to try to find the things we want, i.e. replace house, householder grief with householder joy. That's when you get the sights and sounds and smells and tastes and tactile sensations that you'd like, the ideas that you'd like. But the Buddha says, you abandon householder grief by relying on renunciant grief. Renunciate grief is when you think about the fact that you haven't gained awakening yet. And you'd really like to gain the peace, you'd really like to gain the happiness and the freedom that come with awakening. Now this kind of grief actually goes someplace. It's like the tension on when you pull back a bow that shoots the arrow. Because this kind of grief focuses you on what you really would like to do, and it focuses you on the fact that there is a path to that awakening. So instead of just mucking around in the grief and joy that come from losing and then gaining and then losing and then gaining and losing again, the pleasures of the senses, you focus on developing the elements of the path. And then also the Buddha says, Abandon householder grief by relying on renunciate grief. And then he goes on to say, Abandon renunciate grief by relying on renunciate joy. I.e., when you finally do attain some of that freedom, some of that happiness, some of that peace through the practice. How do you abandon a feeling, though? When the Buddha talks about abandoning or letting go, it's not that your mind has a hand that's grasping things. You're engaged in habitual activities, habitual ways of reacting, habitual ways of thinking, habitual ways of breathing, habitual ways of perceiving things. And as long as you keep repeating those things, you're holding on. When you let go, it's when you stop. You realize that those old habits are not getting you what you want, so you just stop. Or you learn how to stop. It's not that it's always all that automatic. But that's what you're aiming for, learning to see where your habitual ways of fabricating your experience are causing stress and pain, realizing that you can have some alternative skills that you've developed that are not producing that pain. 
then you focus more and more on those skills. Because as I said earlier, there is an element of fabrication, an element of intention in all of our feelings. And so you want to focus on that. There's bodily fabrication, the way you breathe. Verbal fabrication, the way you direct your thoughts to a topic, or direct your thoughts to a feeling. And then evaluation, how you evaluate that feeling. What are you going to do with it? And then there's mental fabrication, which consists of the feelings themselves, plus the perceptions that you're holding in mind. Now those are all things that you can learn how to manipulate, learn how to shape. You've got the raw materials. Sometimes the raw materials are a little recalcitrant, but there are things you can do with them. So even though there's a pain or a weakness in the body, you don't have to obsess about the pain or the weakness. You can focus on where your strengths are. You can focus on where your pleasures are. Focus on different ways of breathing. What kind of breathing would give you more strength? What kind of breathing would give you more pleasure? Experiment. Learn about these things. What ways of thinking about the breath and evaluating the breath give more pleasure? What perceptions of the breath give more pleasure, give you more strength. These are all things that you can manipulate, that you can play with. And just knowing that you're not just a hapless victim of these things, of your pains, helps get you on the right side. Sometimes a useful perception is seeing the pain as something receding from you. Think of yourself as sitting in the back of a, one of those old station wagons where they used to have the seats that faced back. You were sitting there watching the road recede away from you as you're actually headed in the direction behind your back. So when a pain comes, it's not that it's actually coming. The pain is going, 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 going. You're watching it go, go, go. Another pain may come to replace it, but that's, that's just another pain that you're going to watch go, go, go. Holding that perception in mind, you're not on the receiving end of a lot of this stuff. And it's a lot easier to take it. Because you do see the individual moments of pain do go, 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 go. And as you focus on that, it gives you less of a sense of being a victim, and more of a sense of the choices that you have. I was involved in a psych experiment years back when I was at college. They'd had these computers generating random numbers. And if your number came up for a particular psych experiment, it was like the whole college was guinea pigs for the psych department. And so it happened during my four years as a student at the college. My name only came up once. But then when I returned after my time in Thailand, the fellowship that had sent me to Thailand gave me a free year back. In the course of that one year, I was, came up for experiments twice, and both of them were experiments that were related to meditation, which was useful because I've been meditating already. And the relevant experiment was this. They would have you put your hand in a bucket of ice water, lots and lots of ice. It was very cold. And then you were told to imagine that the cold in your hand, in my case it was my right hand, could somehow travel over to the left hand, and the warmth in the left hand could travel back to the right hand. Just visualize that happening, and then see how long you can keep your hand in the bucket. So I sat there with my hand in the bucket for five minutes. And the experimenters finally said, okay, you can stop now, you're breaking the curve. What it turned out was that I was one of three groups. Unfortunately, I'd been in the group where you were given a handle on the pain. The first group was told, put your hand in the ice water and then take it out as soon as it gets unpleasant, as soon as you can't stand it any longer. The second group was told, put your hand in the bucket and just try to hold it there as long as you can. And the third group was told, okay, what I was told, gave you something to do with the pain, using your perception, using your, your breath in the sense of the breath energy. They wouldn't have explained it that way, but that's what it was. 
And sure enough, it was the third group could keep their hands in the ice water a lot longer than the other two. So simply having that perception that you do have some role to play in how much pain there's going to be, how much suffering there's going to be, that gives you the confidence to face down a lot of pains that otherwise you couldn't stand. And this is what mindfulness of feelings is all about, is learning how to see the intentional element in the feeling that you're looking at and learn how to change that intentional element so that you're not suffering so much, so that you can abandon unskillful ways of dealing with feelings and replace it with more skillful ones. So instead of jumping back and forth between householder grief and householder joy, or householder distress and householder joy, you jump over to renunciant grief, which, as I said, is like the pulling back the bow that shoots the arrow over to renunciate joy, when you can give rise to not only physical pleasure, but also a sense of mental pleasure, mental ease. Even when there are pains that you can't change, you can still have a sense of mental ease around them. That's what that second frame of reference, feelings in and of themselves, is all about. So always keep in mind the fact you do have some control over these things, and you want to find where that control is and you want to maximize it for the purpose of what's skillful. That's how we bring ardency to the practice of mindfulness. That's how mindfulness is part of the path, because with mindfulness it's not just being barely attentive to things, or have bring bare attention to things. It's keeping something in mind. In this case, you're keeping in mind the fact that there is that intentional element in your feelings, and you can do something about it. You don't want to forget that. You've got to keep that in mind at all times. That's what you're being mindful of. And then you combine that with ardency and alertness. And you get closer and closer to that point where you develop renunciant joy, seeing the results of your practice. The Buddha really did know what he's talking about. That we can find the peace and the freedom and the happiness that he talked about. It's not just something written in books or you hear on Dharma talks. It's something you can find inside yourself.